Genesis 40 in your Bibles this morning. <clears throat> Feeling wronged and waiting for God. Feeling wronged and waiting for God. We've been preaching on the life of Joseph and uh, Joseph is cast into prison. Not because he did wrong, but because he did right. And I think probably one of the single most important things you find in Genesis 40 is that at the beginning, Joseph is in prison. And at the end, he's still in prison. As my children used to say, that's not fair. And I would say, right's not always fair and fair's not always right. Live with it. My question this morning to us would be, are we, are you willing to wait for God? Are we willing to wait for God? When we read the life of Joseph, his situation seems unfair. It seems very grim. I mean, here, here's a good young man. Uh, I would say here's a godly young man who is suffering things that it just doesn't make a lot of sense. It, it certainly doesn't seem fair. And yet God is doing something through the life of Joseph. Now, <clears throat> when you're in a situation like Joseph's in, you usually don't have too many friends. <laughs> Mind you, he's been taken from his family, from his countrymen, He's in prison in Egypt, so you can understand there are probably not that many people there that think highly of Joseph. So he waits. When you read the Bible and know the end of the story, it's fairly easy to say, yeah, but all turns out well in the end. But if you could put yourself into his shoes not knowing what was going to turn out in the end. <clears throat> we know that eventually Joseph emerges triumphant and that he will say one day to the brothers who betrayed him in Genesis 15 verse 20, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. But I can tell you at this moment in chapter 40, I don't think that's what's going through Joseph's head. That he's going to be warning his brothers. You need to remember here that the <clears throat> people who are cast into Pharaoh's prisons often were never heard from again. I mean, that was like the end of the road. It's not quite the same in U.S. prisons today, although sometimes that can happen. Well, they may be heard from again, but sometimes they're carried out in a prostrate position in a box or a body bag, whatever. <clears throat> when, when Joseph was thrown into the pit by his brothers, he had no idea what was going to happen next. <clears throat> he, he knew as much about his future as you and I do about our future today. It's not as if God whispered to him in the pit, hang tough, kid. Don't let them get you down. Sometimes you... I say things to people around here like that. And usually when they're going through the fire, they just kind of... <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like God said, yeah, son, listen, pretty soon you're going to be the prime minister of Egypt. You know? I mean, if, if God said something to you like that, you, you know, just, you know, hang in there, Spencer. In, in eight years, you're going to be the president of the United States. I can imagine that Spencer would be going, I'm going to be president? Because I'm thinking right now, he doesn't have much clue what it would be like to be president. Frankly, I would not envy him. <laughs> There's all kinds of people after you when you're the president. 
But anyway, Joseph had no clue what was going to happen next. He, he, had, he had no clue. I mean, listen, this is not like a, a fairy tale that somebody's telling the story. He had no clue that a, a, a butler and a baker are going to show up. He, he didn't know that was happening. You say, but God knew. God knows everything. <clears throat> so let's read Genesis 40. But I, I want to back up <clears throat> to verse 20 of chapter 39. To give us a picture of the whole story. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Now, just a quick comment. He's there in prison. But remember, when Joseph was brought to Egypt, he was brought there as a prisoner. And remember that Potiphar is the captain of the guard and for all intents and purposes, Potiphar is the prison keeper. Are you with me? Okay. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Chapter 40. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. These weren't just a baker and a butler. These were the, the head guys. And he put them in a ward in the house of the captain of the guard. Who was the captain of the guard? Potiphar. Into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued a season in the ward. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream, in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt which were bound in the prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked, Joseph, uh, he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward if of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpretation of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream, behold, a, wine, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt receive Pharaoh's cup into uh, de thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think, but think on me when it is well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me into the dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said, mm, boy, I'm going to get in on this. No. Well, you didn't read that there, right? I just put that in. And he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was all manner of baked meats for uh, Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. 
Three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the, the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them, yet did not the butler remember Joseph but forget him. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Joseph waits to see what will happen next in his life. Waiting is probably the hardest thing, uh, the hardest discipline of the Christian life. Most of us hate to wait. I know that I do. It's a difficult thing. Probably all of us are waiting on something this morning at this very moment. And no, it's not that you're waiting for me to get done. We all have to wait whether we like it or not. I always talk about Sam's Club. I call Sam's Club, hurry up and wait. You wait to get in to show your card. You wait in line to check out. And then you wait in line to get out. So I call it hurry up and wait. And really waiting is not something that I really enjoy that much. But yet it's something that's part of life. You've heard me say that driving through Kearney is a test of patience because you're always waiting on someone either driving an 18, 37, 52, or four county car. But I've learned for God to give me grace that I can wait as they make their way 20 mile an hour up 2nd Avenue. I just need to slow down. That's what the Lord's telling me. Truth be told, most of life is about waiting. Some of you here today like football games. Do you know how long a football game really is? Well, it's scheduled for one hour, right? Four 15-minute quarters, right? Typically on TV, how long does it take for a, t for a football game to be played? Three plus hours, right? Now, some of these actually sat down and, and figured out what uh, really took place. So let me, let me give you the statistics they wrote down. <clears throat> Out of the three hours, there's 60 minutes for commercials. So they can sell you things of value. 75 minutes when the players are just standing around, which they do a considerable amount of, but the clock is running, obviously. 17 minutes for replays. And after a few other miscellaneous things are thrown in, like they do crowd shots of all the weirdos that have painted themselves six different colors and that. And then you got the, the sports announcers, that they call them the talking heads in the booze, that they, they've, they're analyzing and talking about the game. And then after a few uh, uh, shots of the cheerleaders to show you, I, I haven't figured out how important that is to a football game. But anyway, uh, and then what you have left for a football game of actual playing time is 11 minutes. Wouldn't it be better if they just played 11 minutes and called it and said, let's go home? Amen. <laughs> the truth be told, the action of life is small, but the waiting is large. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Wouldn't it be interesting to find out how much time we all spend waiting for something to happen? You know, I remember when I was in high school, we had a shop teacher, and uh, I'm trying to recall his name, but he talked like this. Now, young men, we're going to learn how to set points in the distributor today. You think I'm kidding? Mm -mm. That's how he talked. And you're sitting there. <laughs> and you're going, okay, let's go set points. Oh no. He was going to talk for at least a half hour. Most of which could have been said in less than 60 seconds. 
And I remember sitting there going, why? Why? But anyway. So, what do we do while we're waiting? The answer is found, I believe, at least in some point here in Genesis 40. Number one, while you're waiting, learn to be faithful. Be faithful. If you read the life of Joseph, and we, we've read just a portion of it today, you'll know this about Joseph. He was faithful. In, in verses 1 through 4, he's there uh, just faithfully waiting. You're, you're probably saying, well, you know, it's not like he had a lot of choices. But you know, there are people that are waiting that are high anxiety people. But he's waiting. We don't know how long Joseph had been in prison when the cupbearer and the baker arrived. Let me do a little sidestep for just a moment here to say this. When Joseph went to Egypt, to Potiphar's house, in effect, he went to prison. Potiphar was the keeper of the prison. And typically what they would do is they would take some of the people out of the prison and use them or, or in the fields and around their house, their properties. And that's what they did with Joseph. And Joseph being the kind of young man who could have said, hey, I'm in prison. I ain't doing nothing around here. I don't owe you a thing. But Joseph didn't do that. Joseph said, okay, I'll just do a good job. Ultimately, doing a good job was rewarded with him probably not spending a whole lot of time in the dungeons, but spending time at Potiphar's house around the property, taking care of things for Potiphar. But now he's been accused falsely. He's now actually thrown into the prison, which Potiphar, the captain of the guard, runs, and he's kept there in prison. I was, I was reading one historical account where it, it gave a, a name for Potiphar's wife. I have no idea where they got that name. And it says in that account that she actually visited him in prison to continue her onslaught to get Joseph to concede to her. By the way, she could have gotten him out of prison by just telling another lie to her husband. He'd been in prison a while when the cupbearer, the butler, and the baker arrived. I think it was more than a day or two, perhaps months, maybe, who knows uh, how long, when these inmates showed up. And uh, he didn't realize that it would be an opportunity, the fact that these guys are there for him to get out. Now, what do you do when you've been unjustly accused? Because Joseph had been. What do you do when people you trusted turn against you? What do you do when everything you've dreamed, everything you've thought, just turns to ashes and becomes a, a burned up mess? What do you do? Are you willing to wait? You know, when you've been wronged, are you willing to wait on God? <clears throat> All these things were, are, were true for Joseph. He, he, he was unjust. I mean, the people he trusted, his brothers had turned against him. Potiphar's wife and Potiphar. <clears throat> All the dreams I think that he probably had as a young man. I mean, you remember the dream was that his father and mother were going to bow down and his brethren were going to bow. And these, these are dreams that I don't know how many other dreams Joseph had. But none of that seems to be happening. <clears throat> but even though things seem to be going bad, Joseph remains faithful to God. Can I tell you, folks, over the years, how many people I have seen that, yeah, when things are going good, everything is wonderful. Praise the Lord. God is so good. But then when things seem to be turning bad, not doing well, all of a sudden it's like, well, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to serve God anymore. We're all capable of falling into that rut. And maybe you already have it sometime. 
Let me give you a statement. The secret of your future is found in your daily routine. The routine we follow today and tomorrow is really a telling thing about the direction of our lives. You know, the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon wrote these words. He says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. I think Joseph understood that. Whatever it was, no matter how well planned your, your day may be, something unexpected is bound to turn up. So, well, I hadn't planned on that one. Boy, that caught me on the blind side. Where'd that come from? But you know what? When those things show up, just grab hold on the Lord and do what you need to do. Just keep on doing what you need to do. That's what Joseph did. <clears throat> this, this, these verses, I mean, they, they tell us that we just need to take hold of the ordinary responsibilities of life and just make sure they get done because that's what Joseph was doing. It wasn't like he was looking for this elite thing to do. He was doing the mundane, the routine things of life. I'm thinking God expects that and likes that in us. <clears throat> it's so easy for us to live in a never, never land of what we plan to do tomorrow. We dream about things we think we want or should do. And while we dream about tomorrow, the important tasks, the everyday routines get left undone. Don't take care of it. But Joseph was busy with everyday things, the routine of life, doing his best, uh, doing it to the best of his ability. That's what he did. And it may be small, those things. They, they may seem trivial. But there is always something that needs to be done, is there not? You know, washing, cleaning, writing a note, phone bills, paying bills, making a phone call to someone, cleaning the house, cleaning the garage, putting gas in the car, picking up the kids, you know, taking your pills, praying, reading your Bible, feeding the dog. There's always something that needs to be done, is there not? Yeah, but there's nothing exciting about that. It's routine. You know, I've often thought about how many meals my wife has prepared since we've been married. How many menus she has planned. And I have to tell you, that has to get a little mundane after a while. Although feeding me is a great honor. And, I, you know, I feed well. Isn't that true, honey? <laughs> it's mundane. I watch her every morning. She gets up and stands in front of that mirror. And I was recently with my sister-in-law, and I found out when she gets up in the morning, she goes like this. And you can tell. <laughs> Every Friday, I watch her get up and lay all the clothes out on the floor in different colors and start the wash machine. It's pretty mundane, isn't it? After 40 plus years. But you know what? In doing those things, she, I, you, we honor the Lord taking care of the responsibilities of life. That's what Joseph did. And he did it when it really wasn't his. He was sold. He was imprisoned. He was, he was doing it for other people. I mean, at least we're doing it for us. You know why I believe that Joseph was promoted by Potiphar, the captain of the guard, the keeper of the prison, to take care of his house? Because Joseph was the guy that just took care of whatever God put in his hand right then. Do you, do you know why after he's cast into prison, the dungeon, that pretty soon the keeper of the prison 
elevates him to a position because Joseph just takes care of things, the mundane things of everyday life. As he's waiting on God, he could, as many people do, he could have just said, this is not fair. This is not right. I didn't do anything. I don't deserve to be. God, where are you? That's what he could have done. But you don't find Joseph doing that. You find Joseph just doing the duties of life. Wronged? Yes. Waiting on God? Yes. Now we're privileged. We know the end of the story. But if you were going through the story as Joseph, how would you feel? By the way, you are going through a story. It happens to be your life. <clears throat> the question is, will we be faithful where we are, even when life seems to make no sense whatsoever? <clears throat> be faithful. Second of all about Joseph is be ready. In verses 5 through 8, we see this very thing. They came in, they dreamed a dream. Joseph is paying attention. These guys are plagued by their dream. You ever been plagued by a dream? My favorite dream time is when I dream and I wake up and I can't remember the dream. Not when you wake up remembering the dream. That haunts people. <clears throat> Here he is. He's ready. He didn't know these guys were coming. He didn't know he'd have to be taking, two, uh, taking care of two of the guys from Pharaoh's house. He didn't know any of that, but he's doing it. <clears throat> when you think about it, there are dreams all the way through Joseph's story. I mean, he, he first has them in Genesis 37. Then he has them here in Genesis 40. And then we're going to find out later on down the road that Pharaoh's going to have a dream. In each case, the dreams prove crucial in the life of Joseph. In Genesis 37, Joseph has his dreams that he shares with his brothers. And what that did was it made them hate him more. But in Genesis 40, the baker and the butler turned to, to Joseph and they said, help us. And Joseph tells him, well, you know, dreams are of the Lord here. Let me, let me hear. And so he interprets the dreams. Evidently, he believes that God will fulfill his dreams. I'm talking about Joseph. He doesn't say, uh, don't worry, fellas. I'm an expert in dreams. I can figure this out for you. He says in verse uh, 8, it says, do not interpretations belong to God? I love Joseph. Everything in his life keeps pointing to God. <clears throat> he was telling them, he said, my God knows your dreams. And he can explain them to you. You know, Joseph stood out among his own generation because he, he saw God's hand everywhere in his life. <clears throat> And did you know that God does some of his best work in prison? I'm thinking that's why, because people can't get away. Uh, one thought that comes to my mind is that there's a book called Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know how many of you have ever read, read that book. But it's when a Baptist preacher by the name of John Bunyan was in prison in Bedford, England. And they offered to let him out. They said, we'll let you out. Just, you got to quit this preaching. He said, you let me out this morning. I'll be preaching on the street this afternoon. They said, well, we'll just keep you here. And he said, fine. So he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. What a great book. <clears throat> Joseph's example leads me to ask this question this morning. Are you ready to serve God right where you are? Even when you'd rather be someplace else. Joseph was ready to do that, to serve God right where he was. I've had people tell me over the years things like, 
I just can't serve God here. And I always go, why? If Joseph could serve him in prison, if Joseph could serve him in the pit, if Joseph could serve him when everybody else turned against him, if Joseph could serve him when he was wronged, why is it people today who don't have any of that claim they can't serve God? Could it be they're lying? Could it be they just don't want to? Can I ask you a question? Are there lost souls living around us, folks? That would be a, That would be one of these. Yes, there are lost people all around us. What, what is the primary job that I believe that you and I have to do in this world? Is to preach the gospel to every creature, would it not be? Why would we ever say, I can't serve God? When there's so many people that need to hear. They're everywhere. But I hear it. Joseph truly hadn't done anything wrong when he asked for help to get out of prison. But Joseph is not, you know, sometimes you get an opinion of Joseph that maybe he's this meek little guy. No, I think Joseph is a very bold, very strong. I think he's a type A personality from everything I read. And so he didn't do anything wrong asking for help to get out of prison. <clears throat> On one hand, he is faithful and ready to serve God where he is. On the other hand, he doesn't want to stay in prison forever. I don't know if you could blame him for that. It's as, it's as if he's saying, I'm here, but this is not my whole life. I'm pretty confident of that. And I'm not done yet. And God's not done with me yet. And I'm going to keep on serving. But I'm going to do it right now. And I'm going to keep on no matter what God does. If he sends me into a deeper prison, I'll do that. I'd sure like to get out of here. But he's saying, I accept where I am for the moment, but I hope to be set free eventually. Some years ago, I watched a movie called Shawshank Redemption. The guy was accused, the guy named Andy was accused of murdering his wife and her lover. And he runs on to a friend in prison by the name of Red. And they're, one of the scenes, they're walking across the, the yard, and Andy is expressing his hope of getting out someday when Red says to him, you got to give that up. Look at us. We'll never get out of here. Andy pauses for a moment. He says, it comes down to a simple choice. We either get busy living or get busy dying. I remember in the movie, he, he gets out and he gets out by poking a hole in the sewer line and swimming through the sewer. I'm thinking he wanted out. Do you think? So many people lose hope. You know, when hope is gone, life is over, isn't it? There's no place to go. <clears throat> In a few days, I will celebrate my 65th birthday. Does that seem old? <laughs> One's just looking at me, two have a little smile. Does that, seem, does that seem old? Evelyn goes, no, that doesn't seem old. <laughs> that fact in itself is not very, uh, very notable fact. But it's good to use your birthday as a means of taking stock of where you are in life. They say when a man turns 60, he becomes a philosopher of sorts. They say that 60 is the new 50. That may be true, but I can tell you right now what it's not. It's not the new 30. When you turn 65, you can't kid yourself about where you are on the journey. 
I just, I, I've said this before, I, I'm definitely closer to the end than I am the beginning. I, I say it a little bit different. Sometimes people get upset with it, but I, I would say, you know, I'm mostly dead already. <clears throat> Someone wrote a note. They said, birthdays are good for your health. The more you have, the longer you live. Now, that cheered me up just a wee bit. <laughs> the, the fact of our coming death can make us timid, like, oh boy, <laughs> or it can make us bold. Right now I'm in the mental mode of refusing to get old. And I've always said to young people, learn to grow old without getting old. Some of you will get that in a minute. But I believe this. God has put before each of us things that we need to do. And I believe we need to go do it. Amen? You say, oh, I need to go follow. I'm not talking about a bucket list. I'm talking about what God's put before us right now in life that we need to be doing, and I think we need to go do it. That's what Joseph did. By the way, Joseph didn't necessarily settle for his current situation. I think he's looking ahead. I don't know how far he can see. I don't believe he thought one day he would be the prime minister of Egypt. But he's looking ahead. By the way, he wanted to get out of jail. I think he probably thought about the day he could be out of jail and go back to his family and, and, and was working toward that, living toward that. He didn't just give up, throw in the towel and say, it's over. So Joseph said to the cupbearer, remember me. That makes pretty perfect sense to me that Joseph didn't settle for the idea that I'm here forever. And yet, the Bible teaches he was faithful in prison. He was ready in prison. He was bold in prison. What do you do while you wait? What do you do? You be faithful. You be ready. You be bold. There's all the what ifs of life. Verse 23 of chapter 40 gives us the end of the story. You know, in the fairy tale, and they all lived happily ever after. That's not how this story ends in verse 40. And yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph but forget him. <laughs> remember Joseph said, now when you get out of here, remember me. And he said, sure. And he got out and he said, who? <laughs> well, that's a bummer, don't you think? The cupbearer forgets Joseph. But that happens all the time in life. We make promises we don't keep. We intend to stay in touch, but we don't. We plan to call a friend, but we don't. The what ifs of life will kill you. When the cupbearer got out, he promptly left prison far behind and he forgot. And Joseph may have asked many questions of himself. What if the cupbearer never remembers me? What if I die here in this prison? What if I never get a chance to clear my name? You know, the what ifs of life can literally kill you. Let me give you a few. What if I lose my job? That's a possibility in our world, isn't it? What if I never get married? What if we can't have children? What if things don't work out? What if we run out of money? I mean, what if my husband makes a bad decision? And it, it, what if our children get sick? I mean, what if I, what, we can't find a place to live? I mean, what, oh, what, oh. And sometimes people run around like Chicken Little. You know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, you know. What 
if that chemo doesn't work? I want you to put yourself, if you can, this morning in Joseph's place. The only people who can help him think he's dead. Or people that can help him think he's committed a vile crime. Or as the butler, they've forgotten him completely. What do you do then? That all depends on how big your God is. How big is your God? How big is he when you've been betrayed, when you've been enslaved, when you've been falsely accused, when you have been imprisoned, when you have been forgotten? In Joseph's case, his God was a big God. And Joseph's experience in prison reminds us that God doesn't keep time the same way we do. The Bible says in Psalms 90 and verse 2, He is from everlasting to everlasting. And by the way, God has never sat in heaven and wrung His hand saying, Oh my, what am I going to do? The Bible says, Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. <clears throat> There's no... I mean... Time is no complication to God. He never hurries. There are no deadlines against which he must work. He's, he, he's never late. He's never behind schedule. He's right on time. And even though the cupbearer did forget Joseph, guess who didn't forget him? God didn't forget him. God didn't. <clears throat> so what would you do while you wait? What would you do? Would you wait on the Lord? Because they that wait on the Lord, the Bible says, renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. By the way, our Redeemer is on the way. He's just not working on my schedule. He's got his own schedule. And I close with this. To read you the words of a song by William Cowper who struggled with depression most of his life. Let me read you the words. God moves in mysterious ways his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Be fearful, saints, fresh courage take. No, ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Let God be God and all will be well. Judge not the Lord by a feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God in his own interpreter God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. Let God be God and all will be well. When you've been wronged, are you willing just to wait on God? You know what? God's always been willing to wait on us. Some here this morning. God may be waiting on you just to give your life to Him. Maybe He's talked to you over and over and over, and you've said no, no, no. Did you ever think about the fact that He actually does speak to you? And He keeps on. He doesn't give up. He keeps calling unto you. Do you ever understand how important that is? How much that shows His love? How much that shows how real he is that he keeps on. You got to come to him today. Amen. If you're a Christian, you're all out of sorts and life's just not going the way you thought it should go. Maybe what you're needed to learn today is how to just keep on doing the things that God has set before you that can, you consider to be routine and mundane, just keep on doing them as unto the Lord while you wait on God to work His plan in your life. 
Can you do that? Let's pray together. Father, every person here has a different story to tell. Every life that's represented this morning, you died for. You love so much. Oh, Father, sometimes we're so hard-headed. We get into the pity parties and say, woe is me, and oh, poor me. Joseph didn't do any of that. He's a hero in my eyes. And yet, he was another man, just like me, who just chose to keep his eyes on you. Thank you for putting that in your word. I pray that you'd help folks here today that are struggling with those very things. Father, there's that one that's not saved. You've been speaking to their heart. You've been calling to them. Father, I don't understand why they wait, why they hold off. But I thank you for your long suffering. I thank you for your patience. Pray that you would keep calling to them. Pray that today they'd say yes. We'll thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.